All right, if you'll take your Bibles with me, with us this morning, we're going to take a look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we already kind of looked at the opening verses this morning, but I'm going to pick up John chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 29, and then jump into verse 35. John chapter 1, verse 29 says this, The next day he, that's John the Baptist, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In verse 31, it tells us that the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples of John the Baptist, the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? When I was in Eunice, we would say, Can anything good come out of Mamu? I mean, really, anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come. And see, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before, Peter, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. How many of you uh, stayed up late or got up early for the uh, big lunar eclipse a few days ago? Anybody stay up late, come up early? You know that they talked about it for several days in the news, and I'm sure that somebody posted it on your Facebook feed uh, all about it. Uh, it was supposed to be the most significant lunar event in over 500 years. I don't even remember the last one. It was a big deal, 500 plus years since this event was going to happen. And so as you go to bed that night, you're like, okay, do I need to set the alarm? What time is it supposed to be at its peak? Do I want to see this? Do I want to stay up late for it? Do I want to get up early? And then I said, does it really matter? <laughs> and I'm like, how do, is this really, I, mean, I know it's once every 500 years, but is this really a big deal or not? And so I began to process it and think, 10 years from now, Am I going to care whether I saw this thing? Uh, three months from now, are people still going to be talking about this thing? Tomorrow morning, am I going to wish that I had slept, or am I going to be glad that I got up? Now, a couple of folks in the first service, they did get up and see this. You know, first service folks would kind of do that. They, they, they're early is good for them. So, so they did see this. I did not. That was the conclusion that I came to. But the reason that I bring this up is because while we can have that discussion about whether this really matters or not, there are people today who are asking the exact same question about the Christmas story. Does this matter? 
They are asking this question about the gospel of Jesus. Does this really matter? They are asking this about our Christian faith. They are asking the question, in 10 years will this make a difference? Three months from now, is this going to change my life? Tomorrow, am I going to care anything about this story? In fact, as we come to this Christmas season and we think about the story of the the infant, we think of Mary and Joseph and the nativity and all of those things, There are many people that are wondering, does that stuff even matter anymore? Well, I've got good news for you this morning. In fact, I've got great news uh, for you this morning. The great news, the good news is that Jesus is no flicker, phantom, or footnote of history. He is, in fact, the ongoing hope for all people today. In fact, one of the things that we say here at Woodland Park Baptist Church is that we like to say hope is here. Our website is hopeforhammond.com. The reason we say hope is here, when we talk about hope, that's the hope that we're talking about. It is Jesus. He is that entire hope. And so the answer to the question is, does it matter? Oh, yes, because he is not just a flicker, a phantom, or a footnote of history. He is the hope for all people today. Even though it's been a couple thousand years, he is more relevant today than he has ever, ever been. I'm excited about these messages. I have a a practice over the years of ministry that that I like to put together a series of messages for Christmas. I like to pull together, well, we'll take a look at the Christmas themes in Scripture, and we'll we'll do a series of messages for Christmas. And I I look forward to that. And then later in the year, I'll do a season or a series of messages for the Easter season as well. So there's a Christmas series of messages, and then later in the year, there's an Easter series of messages messages. I'm so excited this year because what we're going to do is that we're going to do one series of messages that's going to take us all the way from Christmas all the way to the resurrection. We are going to take this series and we are going to tell the whole story from the gospel of John. And so we're going to begin with this passage this morning that says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We're going to start right there at the beginning. And then we are going to go all the way until the resurrection moments of Jesus' life. And so we're going to dig into this gospel of John, and we're going to invite you to dig in to that with us. A couple of the Sunday school classes are going to be studying this at the same time. We're going to give you some tools later this morning on how you can dig in as we go so that we can walk through this journey and see the whole story from Christmas to Easter together using the gospel of John. Now, I'm excited about the Gospel of John. It's written by the apostle named, all right, good good job, sharp crowd. First service didn't get that. That's not true. Uh, The apostle John, the apostle John, a couple things for you to know about the apostle John is one, he was the, the youngest of the disciples. So the, first of all, he, he was one of the disciples. Everything that we see and read over the next several months are going to be things that he was there in the room for. He was watching. He was present. He saw all of it. We also discovered that he was, at the beginning, the youngest of the disciples. But we also discover that he is the last living of the disciples. In fact, he is the, the, the one that when everyone else is gone that had ever broken bread with Jesus, he is the last one uh, standing. And so therefore his word, his testimony means so much because he knows that he is the last person alive that can tell you this story firsthand. I also think it's fantastic because I think that he is the person who told the story longer than any of the other disciples. So he has been telling the story of Jesus over and over and over and over again. And what we get is this polished, complete story of who Jesus is. In fact, the, uh, the Apostle John, 
is a, is a masterful storyteller. Uh, now, he's not the John that's in John chapter 1. It's a little bit confusing there because we, we actually hear of a couple other Johns that are mentioned in John uh, chapter 1. The, the John that we see mostly in that is John the Baptist. He is Jesus, his cousin, uh, but they don't see each other probably. They probably move in different directions, but that's not the John that we're talking about. The John that we're talking about is the Apostle John, and it's interesting, the name of John never gets in the story. He kind of holds his name out of the story. And, and there's some really neat things about that that we'll talk about uh, later. But, but John is the middle of the story even though you never see his name in the story. I think in some part, John wanted to make sure this is a story about Jesus, this isn't a story about me. Now I was there, but don't miss, this is about Jesus. Now I also think of all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of them have their own personality. Each one of them have their own attributes. But there's something about the Gospel of John that I, I think in some ways would be the most literary. It is the most intricately woven together, pieces connected in the way the themes are developed in the Gospel of John more profoundly than any others. He is a masterful storyteller. You know how sometimes... Uh, when, when you just, the opening moments of a, of a movie or the opening moments of a book, uh, the first characters begin to appear. And the questions that you wonder about when those first characters begin to appear is, uh, who is that? Uh, who are they related to? Are they going to be in the whole story? Do they matter at all? John answers all of those questions for us here in John chapter 1. He tells us all of these things. In fact, John is a masterful storyteller, but he also is a living, breathing spoiler. Uh, you know, you're a spoiler alert. He just tells you right off the bat. Let me just tell you, the, the biggest thing that he tells you, he tells you in the first sentence of the book. He tells you, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He tells you the first sentence, Psst, he's God. He's God. Let me tell you how the story ends. Let me tell you the most important thing. There's nothing to be revealed down the road that's a bigger deal than the fact that this Jesus, who this whole book is all about, he is God. And he lays that right up front for you to see. In fact, what he wants you to know is you filter the whole rest of this story. Know that this person that we are talking about is God. There's no other story like it. Because there's no one ever been who Jesus is. Now, there's a handful of other things that John emphasizes here in John chapter 1. And so let's unpack some of those together. Uh, the first thing that we see here is that John would tell us that Jesus is the linchpin of history. Jesus is the linchpin of the entire cosmos, in fact. Now, it's kind of interesting, if John were the only gospel that we had, we wouldn't have Christmas. Do you notice that as you read through John chapter 1? There, there's no story in John chapter 1 about Mary. There's no story about Joseph. There's no story about wise men. There's no story about shepherds. There's no story about a star. There's no story about a manger. The innkeeper doesn't even get mentioned in John chapter 1. The whole Christmas story is missing from the gospel of John. Now, the Christmas stories are really, really important. The Christmas stories remind us of the miraculous events that surround Jesus' birth. The Christmas stories remind us that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. The Christmas stories remind us and inform us of the deity of Jesus, and that is that Jesus is God. So those Christmas moments that we're going to emphasize during our Christmas night of worship next Sunday night, those Christmas moments are so important because they reveal those things. But John, he's just going to speak to those things in a completely different way. He's not going to miss any of those notes. In fact, here in these opening verses that we read at the beginning of the service, he wants you to know right up front, Jesus is God. There's no question about the deity of God 
once you get past verse 1 of this book. But he also wants you to know that this Jesus, that he is going to spend this entire book on, that he is the one who holds the whole universe together. He says that in the beginning, (laughs) Jesus was already there. He predates the beginning. He predates time. He predates this world. It also tells us that this world was created by Jesus. I kind of chuckle and think uh, about the possibility of the disciples walking around some beautiful feature, some beautiful mountain, seeing some beautiful sunrise uh, unfold, and, and for Jesus to say, yeah, I made that. I made that. He, he is the one who put all of those things in place. He, he is the one who created this universe. He is the one who holds this universe together. He is the one that the gospel tells us is the light of the world. And then it tells us that he is the one who was the creator of this world, who then stepped into this world and lived into this world. Chapter 1, verse 14, and then the word became flesh. And he lived right down the street from us. The Word became flesh, and He lived right next door. The Word became flesh and walked in the same marketplace that we walked in. But Jesus is this linchpin that holds it all together. Before time, before creation, He is creation, and He holds it all together. But He would also tell us that Jesus is the solution to all of the brokenness. Jesus is the solution to all of the brokenness. Now, we live in a really divided world. We live in a world where there are so many different points of view. We disagree on just about everything. You can be walking through the grocery store and not know what kind of political, philosophical point of view the person next to you has. Who knows? It just seems like there are so many different ways to see the world, and some of them seem so opposite one another. But you know what's really strange is that there's probably one thing that unifies all those different persuasions, all those different points of view. And that is if you were to get in a room and you would just mumble to somebody next to you and just say, man, is this world messed up? And they would say, yeah, I know, right? Just try it. Everywhere you go this week, you'll be the most encouraging person around. Just say, man, is this world messed up? No matter who you stand next to, they will say, I know. Now, we, we may not initially agree on the parts that are messed up and the parts that are good, but all of us have this sense, it is broken. And again, the author of the Gospel of John says, I know the answer. I know the solution. I know the fix to the brokenness of this entire world. He highlights the words of John the Baptist who point to Jesus in a public setting for the first time and don't say there goes the miracle worker, there goes the great teacher, there goes the amazing person. Doesn't even say there goes the Son of God but says Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Every piece of brokenness in this world is potentially healed and solved in the person of Jesus. It's the reason that he came. I want you to know that every piece of brokenness woundedness and sin that I have carried into this world and added to this world is solved through Jesus. I want you to know that every piece of brokenness, rebellion, and sin in your life is solved by Jesus. 
But I want to amplify that for a moment. I, I want you to notice just not that Jesus takes away sin. But what I want you to notice is that Jesus takes away the sin of the world. That's who it is that we gather to worship here. That's the one who's the center of the story. He doesn't just take away little pieces of sin. He doesn't just smooth off an edge over here. He doesn't just come to make your marriage better, or your kids happier. He, he doesn't just make you a slightly better person. He has come to take away the sin of the entire world. Every bit of brokenness if we will yield to him, he will heal and he will reverse the curse of sin. That's what Jesus came to do. This Jesus that we worship, he's not just about miracles. It's not just about great teaching. He has come to solve every piece of brokenness in this world. That's what he came for. And John says, don't get to chapter 2 without knowing that he came to take away the sins of the world. John, I also think, wants us to know that Jesus is all about relationships. I think there's been a little bit of a challenge in preparing to preach John chapter 1 because there's so much material here in John chapter 1. And at the beginning of John chapter 1, there's this cosmic statement that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and He was the light of the world, and the world did not know Him, and the world did not see Him, and yet the darkness could not overcome His light. Great, big, cosmic statements in the middle of it. There's this theological statement. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But the back half of the chapter is Jesus and people. It's Jesus talking to folks that could have been at your Thanksgiving table this week. It's Jesus just talking to regular folks like the folks you went to high school with, the folks that you go to work with, uh, the folks that you see in traffic. The whole back half of this chapter is this statement that the cosmic linchpin became flesh and he dwelt among us. And he wants to know you. And he wants to know you. And he wants to know you. And he doesn't just want to know you. He wants to invite you to know him. In fact, the emphasis here is so relational that he talks to individual people. We start to catch the names of people, Andrew and Simon and Philip and Nathaniel. Personal people. They stay with him. They walk with him. They have conversations with him one on one. I want you to know that this Jesus, he wants to talk to you. And have a relationship with you. I want you to know the relationships that Jesus has with the folks here in John chapter 1 and that he wants to have with you are relationships that are full of grace. Man, he is just talking to some dudes and some dudettes. These aren't theological hotshots. These aren't the religious superstars. These are just guys. They don't have their stuff together. You're going to see the whole rest of the book. These guys really don't have their stuff together. But Jesus says, come on. Come. 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 In fact, the relationship that Jesus invites these men to is really experiential. I love this little weave that we have here in this gospel. The two disciples of John the Baptist hear John say, this guy's the deal. This guy, I'm, I'm not the deal. This guy's the deal. If you're going to follow somebody, that's the guy to follow. And so the two disciples of Jesus, they, they follow Jesus. Jesus looks back. I mean, they're literally following Jesus. I mean, they're, they're literally walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And he's like, man, what do you guys want? He says, well, where are you staying? Which is just another way of saying, can we hang out with you? And Jesus says, Come and see. 
kind of an answer is that? Jesus, we want to know where you're staying. <laughs> he says, come, see, see for yourself. <laughs> Philip tells Nathaniel, man, we found, we found the Messiah. We found the person the entire Old Testament is written about. It's Jesus of Nazareth, and it's this you know, thing about, can any good thing come from Nazareth? You hear what Philip says to Nathaniel? Come and see. Come and see. He, he says to him the same thing that Jesus just told the disciples. Now Philip tells Nathaniel, come, see. And then I love, there's this whole thing with, with Nathaniel and the fig tree. And, 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 and Jesus walks up to Nathaniel and says, now here's a guy that is a straight shooter. There's no deceit. There's no guile in this person. Nathaniel says, man, how do you know me? You, 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 don't, you don't know that about me. And then there's this real mysterious conversation. Jesus says, man, I saw you under the fig tree. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know what's happening under the fig tree. But Nathaniel suddenly says, you are the king of Israel and the son of God. To which Jesus says, you believe all that because I saw you under the fig tree? And Jesus says, come, wait till you see what's next. You see, the book of John is all about belief. It's a book about belief. In fact, John puts his purpose statement at the end of the book in John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And what you're going to find is that from John chapter 1 to John 20 to John 21, on almost every single page, you're going to find somebody believing in Jesus. You're going to find someone who comes to believe in Jesus. Now, sometimes it's a process, and sometimes it's compressed here on the page, but it is the process where someone meets or discovers Jesus. It's the process where somebody considers Jesus. Can anything good really come from Nazareth? Can anything really good come from the Bible? Can anything really good come from 2,000 years ago? It's considering. But it ends with believing. My God, Messiah, Christ, Savior. And what you're going to find is that you're going to find an echo of your own belief on these pages. Or maybe, maybe you will begin your belief in the middle of these pages. So what does this mean for us this morning? What, what is the now what for us this morning? Uh, first of all, Man, I just pray that in the middle of this season that you will have a fresh rediscovery of who Jesus is. That, that, that you will be able to peel back some labor, some layers of habit and some just all the things that you've just kind of picked up and, and once again rediscover Jesus on the page from someone who was right there and says, let me tell you about Jesus who is the linchpin of the cosmos, who is the solution to all brokenness and who wants to have a relationship with you. Would you prayerfully consider in this season to ask God for a fresh revealing of his son to you? And then secondly, will you join us in this journey of making the Gospel of John your handbook for this season between Christmas and Easter. We want to help you uh, with that as you go out today. Uh, we have one of these for most of you. If you get there fast, we've got one for you. We've got extras that are coming. It's just the Gospel of John. 
It's a book. It's the Gospel of John. And what you have is the, the text on one page, and on the other page is a blank page. You do with it what you want. In fact, Michael has given us some little bookmarks, and on the bookmark there's some study questions for you to study and read through the passage. Our challenge to you is we're going to preach one chapter a week, but we want to challenge you to be ahead of us and to be reading that chapter. Now, for some of you, that may mean that, that every day that week you read that chapter and you make those notes. For others of you, maybe you just read until you're full. Maybe that's a paragraph. Maybe that's two paragraphs. Maybe you set aside one time during the week and say, I'm going to study this hard. But whatever it is, man, pick one of these up and make this part of your life. I was talking to someone not too long ago and they said, man, church is great. And I love what happens in church and small groups. But they said, my faith has grown the most between Monday and Sunday when I'm in the Word by myself. So we want to challenge you to do that. And then if you're not a believer, if you're not a person who has given your life to Christ and said, you are my King, <laughs> you are the Son of God, you are the one who takes away my sin, if you've not come to that place, man, I want you to live on the edge of your seat as Jesus has revealed to you. I want you to be ready to say yes. And in fact, it may be that today is the day to be reminded that Jesus has invited you and maybe that's your day. Maybe today's your day. But maybe if it's not today, my challenge for you is that I'd listen every day. And I'd say, is today the day that I'm supposed to believe? If today's your day, Michael and I will be down front. I'll be in the back. We want to invite you to respond. But a fresh vision, a regular commitment to be in the Word and a readiness to believe. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that you'll do a work here. Lord, we, we choose here because that's where we are. <laughs> Lord, we know that this church isn't any more special than another church. But we want this to be a church where the blessing of God is poured out over lives. And people discover you. So Lord, we ask that that would be happening in this church. And that includes the people who sit here today. Lord, I pray that you give them a fresh vision of you. Lord, I pray that as they pick up your word, Lord, that the Spirit would stir deeply inside of them. And then, Lord, I pray that across this season and across this day that people will be ready to believe and say yes to Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.